difficult, difficult past year. And we still need to keep our vigilance. With this talk, what I would like to do is give you some updated view of what the pandemic is doing to us currently in Alabama. Also, I would like to make sure that you have the knowledge that you need to help guide those that you serve and to make informed decisions, informed choices um, so that we can use wisdom so that we all can be safe. I'm going to be going through a group of slides and just bear with me as I get everything set up here. So I'm Dr. David Hicks. I'm with the Jefferson County Department of Health, but I'm gonna be talking from a broader statewide perspective. Uh, so I do wanna give everybody an overview of what's currently happening in Alabama. So if you break up the state in different zip codes, different regions, different counties, you're going to see a, a variation on the risk of us getting into trouble with COVID-19 right now. And this is as of currently a, during this presentation, as you can see, the counties in red have the highest risk of suffering outbreak due to COVID-19. And that changes. So the low risk is green, the high risk, and the very, very highest risk is red. So there's a lot of red and that's troubling. And this is related to multiple factors. And we're gonna talk about some of those, but I will just tell you that we know, generally speaking, we don't have the highest vaccination rates compared to our counterparts around the United States. We know that there is an emerging variant strains that are highly contagious. And so we do have to double our efforts to make sure that people know about this uh, pending threat. And we have to think about what are the steps that are necessary to change this tra trajectory, but this is troubling. So this is things that we know about, right? So when you really look at what is proven strategies to decrease the spread of COVID-19, and we, you know, we go back to the pandemic a year ago, a lot of the things at the top is what everyone's familiar with. So social distancing, what is social distancing? Well, everyone's familiar, I think, with the six feet difference between you and the other person, that's based in science. So if I have COVID-19, I may not be aware of it. If I cough or sneeze, those droplets float in the air and they land on the ground. But if you're within six feet of somebody, that is the danger zone of when you can spread COVID-19 from one person to the other. So that's why if we socially distance at least six feet away, the risk of spread decreases. Next is self-isolation and quarantine. So again, if someone is identified to have COVID-19, we want that person to isolate themselves away from others so that they don't spread that. That could be in the workplace, that could be in the church. So you need to remove yourself away from the population so your body can heal up, recover, and you do not spread it because COVID-19 is contagious. And to note, COVID-19 is more contagious than the flu. So this is a different thing than the flu. And then what happens is if someone's unvaccinated and they have COVID-19, we will tell them they need to quarantine themselves away from others and people that they have may have been around that's been close proximity. We call those high risk contacts. So say you were around somebody for at least 15 minutes of time the preceding day, you were within six feet of them as well. And then you found out just now you got COVID-19. Well, that person is a high risk contact to you. And it's a good chance that they could have picked it up from you. So when we do what we call contact tracing, you're the contact. You have COVID-19. Anybody else that you have contacted, we try to find out who those people are. And if there's a high risk contact, 
then we will engage with those people, warn them that they may have been exposed, and then they need to isolate away from others as well, because we know that if you get exposed to COVID-19, you don't immediately become infected. It could take days for that to develop in your body. So we don't wanna run the risk that someone could be out there that has newly contracted COVID-19. They got exposed to somebody at the workplace or in the community, uh, and then they go about their business and then spread it to someone else. So that's the point of the isolation and quarantining. And that's a strategy to decrease spread of disease. Hand cleaning. This is something that we all know, you know, we've learned, you know, wash your hands and good old fashioned soap and water. And then we have hand sanitizers. Well, we know that it has helped. I will also tell you that when we wash our hands, certain viruses can really get stamped out. So for example, a lot of us were doing social distancing and washing our hands and wearing masks and all these things last year, we had all time record lows of the number of influenza cases in our community. But it had limited impact on COVID-19, but it did help, but not as much. And then the face coverings or mask. Okay, so with those, when you put that mask on, remember, if you happen to call for sneeze, we hope that the mask catches some of the droplets and that can decrease the spread of that being spread to someone else. And then there's testing. So when we have a lot of positive cases in the community and we measure that by something called a positivity rate. So if your positivity rate is greater than 5%, greater than 5% of the people that get tested are coming up positive, we need to do more testing so we can identify more cases. And then that means we can then help get people isolated and quarantined and that's our strategy to decrease spread of um, disease and illness. And then there's treatments. So if you do get sick, most people over the counter medications, but then some people have to go in the hospital. And there are now therapies that have been developed that if we get people treated in a, in a timely fashion, it can have a dramatic impact on helping people out. And then the last one, this is kind of that holy grail in the sense where we've been waiting all this time to get good, safe, effective vaccines, and we have safe and effective vaccines. And we'll talk about vaccines soon. But ultimately, that is the end game because all these other strategies we mentioned have limited impact. When you put them all together, they helped us stem the tide as much as we could to get us to the point of safe and effective vaccines. But safe and effective vaccines is the end game, so to speak. So I'm gonna to shift to talking about vaccinations, uh, what's going on in our community, um, just to give everyone updated. And with um, vaccines, here, I'm gonna show you another map, okay? So currently at the time of this presentation, look at the shading. So the darker the shading shows what parts of our community, which counties in Alabama have the highest proportion of their residents that have gotten at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. So look at that. You'll see the counties that have these, the major metropolitan centers and the Black Belt counties have done a great job relative to the rest of the state in vaccinating the population. Now that has been due to concerted efforts, particularly in the Black Belt counties, because we know that there's unique set of disparities in those communities, um, decreased access to services. And the health department put a lot of resources to make sure that information was putting out in the communities and then behind the information, then you had the resources to come and vaccinate. And that's why you see those black belt counties doing very well relative to perhaps some other parts of the state. But if you look at this in context with the whole United States, Alabama is at the bottom. So we cannot get terribly excited and say, oh, look at my community. We have a, we have a decent vaccination rate compared to someone else in, in the state. Because no matter how good one county may be in the state of Alabama, we are still not that great compared to the rest of the United States. And that's concerning because that puts at 
us all at an increased risk of COVID flaring up and we're starting to see cases rise now. All right, so I'm, I wanna break down in a little more depth um, these different groupings of people that are getting vaccinated and not getting vaccinated. So this is a, a bar chart and it, it's separated uh, based on age groups. So on the far left column, you're gonna see the age groups and then you're gonna see the percent vaccinated. So just pay attention to the very bottom, right? So if you see that red color and the lighter blue color, that's people that are age 65 and older. And if you look at the percentage of people vaccinated, you're talking about over 70% of people that fall in that age group in the state of Alabama have been vaccinated. Phenomenal. Unfortunately, as you drop off, when you see when you get to younger than age 50, it's a dramatic drop off in the number of people that have gotten vaccinated. And that's our biggest concern. Because right now what we're seeing is the people that are being hospitalized, the people that are dying due to COVID-19 are by far 90 something percent of those people are unvaccinated. And you can see so you, add, you took a look at that fact I just mentioned, and you look at this chart, you put those together. And what that basically is saying is that people that are gonna get sick from COVID now, generally speaking, people that get hospitalized from COVID, people that unfortunately may die from COVID, by far are more likely to be unvaccinated and they are going to be younger. They're going to be, generally speaking, people that are younger than age 50. It doesn't mean that other people aren't at risk, but the biggest risk, is in those younger folks because they happen to be under vaccinated. Now, one thing to also note is that just because you've been fully vaccinated doesn't mean that your risk is zero. You have a lot better chance of not having some bad COVID symptoms and or you know getting sick from COVID, but the risk is not zero. So you still have to be careful. And particularly people that have compromised immune systems, say you're a diabetic you have lung disease, you have kidney disease, history of cancer, um, a lot of the other things, and older age, you're particularly higher risk because now we're finding out, unfortunately, with this variant strains that are out, and we're having a lot of attention right now on the Delta variant strain, is that if, for people that are fully vaccinated, if they happen to get exposed to the Delta variant strain, that vaccine that you got, although it's really effective, the, the, the effectiveness drops to some degree when dealing with the variant. So that means that people in those higher risk groups still have more risk than someone um, otherwise. So we still have to be careful. So the vaccines is the best way, but even if you get vaccinated, you still have to keep your vigilance up. So here's another um, chart similar, but this is a, a different data. And this is a breakdown for the state of Alabama, the percent of people vaccinated based on the racial ethnic identity. So one thing I would just really want to point out, and if you look at this, so when you look at the, the, the bar, if the bar goes further to the right, that means within that grouping, that's a higher percentage of people that have been vaccinated. So the second one from the top is Asian. When you see 52% of our Asian population in Alabama has been vaccinated. At the very bottom in red is white. So 30% of white residents in Alabama have been vaccinated. And then if you look at Black and African American, which is the green, that's essentially the same, 30%. So we had a concern early on, a legitimate concern that the vaccinations um, were not getting to communities of color equitably. And because there was so much effort to address that concern, we see the same proportion of blacks and whites getting vaccinated, but that still pales in the comparison to 
Asians. All right. So that's troubling. And then you, you know, and there's other groups. Um, American Indian is a lot lower. Um, Native Hawaiian is a lot lower. Um, so there's still work to do in subgroups, but I will tell you that particularly for African Americans, um, they're neck and neck with their white counterparts in the state. But overall, everyone needs to get vaccinated even more. So, you know, that's good news, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, this next thing I'm going to show you is, is pretty interesting, right? This is uh, obviously a map of the United States. And what this is showing is how the CDC estimates what vaccine hesitancy is like in the United States. So I want to give you kind of this big kind of picture. So that dark, deeper, darker blue color represents what we estimate as where the most hesitant of our population resides. And you see, you know, up in the um, mountain, upper kind of Midwest, a lot of hesitancy. And then look at the deep South. So when you go, you know, from Louisiana and go to Mississippi and Alabama, Georgia and Florida, you see more vaccine hesitancy relative to other parts of the United States, for example, the Northeast of the United States or parts of California or in Minnesota. That presents a challenge as we're trying to get people vaccinated. And so when you look at Alabama, we have additional challenges as we're trying to educate the community about safe and effective vaccines where we have relatively more of our population that is estimated to be hesitant to even wanting to get vaccinated. And this helps to explain why Alabama's numbers overall are the way they are. Now, there's this uh, Kaiser Family Foundation, a major health institution in the United States has been doing surveying of the community you know, for months and months and months since this pandemic has really ramped up. And this is some survey information. And I wanted to point this out because this is something that, you know, I, I have found enlightening. So they asked, they, they polled and they asked the question, what's the likely source of where you're gonna get COVID-19 vaccine information? Who's that trusted source? And they asked, and you see based on the age group, what, how people responded based on your race, ethnicity, how you responded, and your political party affiliation. And it, it could be the doctor or the nurse, or it could be the CDC, it could be the health department, a friend or a family member, a pharmacist, a religious leader. And if you look at this, and I, I'm highlighting this, if you see the bottom line religious leaders and overall, uh, less Americans are looking to the religious leader for information about the vaccine. However, if you really drill down and look into to this, that of all the groups that are likely to want to receive information from their religious leader, Blacks and Hispanics, you see that 30, that very bottom of 33%, 29%, those populations are more likely to receive information or want to receive information from their religious leader than any other group. So for me, and, and to this group, that highlights the importance of your role and providing this knowledge and insight uh, to your parishioners. So here's the next thing I wanna talk about. So when we talk about vaccines, a lot of people have a, are hearing a lot of different things, a lot of noise, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And one of the things I think that we have failed to show is just looking at the risk of getting vaccinated in context, because we hear people that say, I'm not going to get vaccinated because of this reason or this reason or this reason. I'm hearing about these side effects. And unfortunately, what happens is when there's a side effect, and there's always going to be a side effect to anything, medicines you take, you swallow a mouth, a vaccine, vaccine that you get, 
that there's always a risk, but it's very small, rare. But they get sensationalized in the media. And then when we hear about a story, then a lot of people see that as affirmation of what they may have had concerns about. And they may say, see, I told you, that's why I'm not getting a vaccine. So look at this. All right. So this is an interesting chart because it basically shows the what are the odds of different things happening to you? So the bigger this kind of circle bubble, bubble you see the, the, the top green, the odds of breaking a bone while you're a child is one out of 55, okay? Very high risk of that happening to you. Look at that, dying in a car accident. One in 22 people have the risk of dying in a car accident. That's high. Childhood cancer, one in 317, and then it drops down. Now look at these different examples. The risk that we would drown in a pool as a child is one in over 10,000 people. Then one in 12,000 people have the risk of being struck by lightning. Keep them going down. The, the odds of any of us being elected to Congress, one in 115,000. Now look at the very last one, that tiniest dot, and this is important. The risk of having a life-threatening allergic reaction to a childhood vaccine, one in a million. So people talk about, is that vaccine safe and should I get it? The odds of all these other things is by far greater than the risk of something happening from a vaccine. Doesn't mean that the risk of getting vaccine is zero. But we have to put these in relative proportion. So when we're talking about should should I do this or not, what I would say is what are the odds of you getting COVID-19 and having something bad happen? And I think we all know people, friends, family members, loved ones that have either got COVID, been sick from COVID, or perhaps unfortunately died from COVID. Compare that to how many of us in this past year know someone who got struck by lightning. So put the concerns in relative perspective. And I think if we educate people this way, that might help people come to um, a better sense of uh, having information to make the decisions they need to make about what they should do regarding getting vaccines and maybe their concerns. But this whole pandemic has caused so much collateral damage. And I think we also need to start having this conversation. We know that the amount of people that are using alcohol and other substances has increased during this pandemic. Overdose deaths, narcotics and opioids have dramatically increased during this pandemic. Domestic violence has gone up and just mental health concerns that we need to just think about. So with increased stress, situations with my job and how I'm gonna make a livelihood, that has led to people um, having a more anxiety and depression. Some people medicate with alcohol or substances. Some people respond to the stressors a lot of different ways that are unhealthy. So this pandemic is not only about, did someone go into a hospital? It's not only about did someone die, it's what are all the other impacts on this. And so, you know, it is to me quite important to think about how we cope with all these stresses and this collateral damage that we're seeing. And um, here, here's, here's a few things here. So just for you yourself, for you to keep you mentally where you need to be, and then how you can then translate that to other people. What I would strongly suggest is find a way to de-stress. Some people do yoga, or maybe you may get that through meditation or music, prayer, uh, people garden, or they may find some kind of new hobby. But you, you, I think we now have to be intentional to take the time to build that into our 
normal daily lives and schedules um, to pace ourselves so that we don't have a nervous breakdown and stress and we need to advise others to do the same. I think we all, all had to try to figure out how we're going to find new ways to socially connect to other people. So if you're um, concerned and say, you know, we've been indoors a lot and not interacting as much as we would like, and, and things are starting to shift there, but we've had to get creative. And so we have these different platforms to do virtual meetings and using our mobile devices to connect with friends and family. But the importance of social interaction is very real. And think about this, even in uh, religious settings, um, for us to congregate and gather and fellowship together is very important um, spiritually, mentally. And we've had to have ways to figure out how we can do this. It's that these things don't supplement that direct human interaction, but it's the best we can do given the circumstances and given the pandemic. Another thing, taking care of our bodies, you know, because we may not have been as active as we used to do, maybe we weren't able to do certain camps and sports and outings, then we've had to be in more intentional about how we're gonna stay fit physically. So that's getting out on trails and walking or getting on a bicycle or even it's just in the comfort of your own space, trying to find a way to do exercise um, right then and there, you know, in, in your room. But we have to build this in automatically. And then this is stuff that we all know, but I think it's even more important now is how do we make sure we maintain healthy diet um, and making sure that we're getting adequate amount of sleep. These are all ways to help deal with those mental stressors that I was alluding to earlier. It's important, but we, I think we need to write them on our calendar, lock them in, um, and, and then encourage all, all those people around us to do the same. So now I want to go through things that are particular considerations for communities of faith. Uh, because I think one of the challenges that many of you may have is going back to in-person worship services. What are the considerations and things that we need to make? And how do we do it safely? And this pandemic has evolved. So we went from extremely high risk and number of cases are really high when we're talking about in December and January. And then the numbers have been dropped to drop dramatically. Great, people are getting vaccinated. So now it's, wow, how can we get back to a nuisance of normal? How can we go back to in-person worship services? Um, and now we're in this conundrum, I think, because now we're starting to see cases going up. So now the question is, oh my goodness, what do we do as we try to have these uh, decisions about the in-person, you know, services and, and, and how do we make sure we keep everyone safe in those settings. So let me go through a couple of those things, right? Uh, the first kind of broad category is about safety, okay? So I'll give you, a, you know, a couple of things I think everyone absolutely needs to consider. So for the staff that works in, you know, in, you know, in the facilities, and for the congregants that come, I still encourage them to maintain good hand hygiene. Wash your hands with old fashioned soap and water. Now, that's for 20 seconds. And, and I think we need to just remind people of that. Um, now, if you don't have soap and water, use a hand sanitizer, but you want it to be, have at least 60% alcohol content in that. But I think that I should make I recommend making that readily available to people and encouraging people to do that. Um, because remember, as people are touching different surfaces and you don't ever know when you can pick up a germ and that germ could be COVID-19, particularly because we're seeing now a, a rise in the number of cases and we don't know who has what, because you, just because you, you may be carrying 
COVID-19 and may not be symptomatic at all and not even know you have it and that you may be passing it on to someone else unbeknownst to you. Now, another thing for, from a sanitation uh, perspective is making sure that sinks are accessible to people to be able to wash their hands and, 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 and clean. Uh, also, covering your cough and sneezes. As we get into the fall and winter months, every year we always see an increase in the number of people that are sick. So that basic cough etiquette is when people need to cough within their elbow and something that we should always have been doing and even more so in the context of a pandemic. Um, now, you know, in your, you know, in your religious facilities, make sure that you keep ample supply of soap, um, make sure people have ability to dry their hands after they clean themselves, you know, the paper towels or the hand dryers, um, and have enough hand, hand sanitizer available um, so that people have that as a, a resource. Um, another thing that some people don't think about is even when you're, you're, you know, you're wiping hands and you say you have a paper towel, you want to minimize people having to touch the wastebasket. So if they can just drop it into a wastebasket or there's a pedal where it can automatically lift and then you could drop something in, that minimizes the number of common surfaces that people have to touch. Another thing I would say um, is don't forget to wipe down doorknobs and handles. People are going in and out of rooms, offices, uh, restrooms. So I think having those wiped more frequently than you normally up otherwise would have um, is really important. So you could consider putting signage up to just remind people to do those things. Um, that's certainly an, an option. Um, and then obviously covering their cough, you know, in, in, in sneezes is something now let's kind of shift with masking. Um, and, and this all depends on um, how much disease is floating around in the community at the present period in time. Um, the present time we're in right now, a lot of places say that masking is optional. I think that's just something that you have to use your own wisdom on just to see what the local environment um, is. Uh, but just be aware that a safer environment for everybody is if a mixed company would be outdoors. So when you go indoor, then that it potentially increases the risk of people that are in a, in a closed in setting if the cases are rising um, and, and things are going in the wrong direction. So it, it would certainly be appropriate if you choose to, to tell people that you expect them to wear a mask while they're indoors. But that's something that you'll have to decide and what you feel comfortable with um i would just just note that you know you don't want to put a mask on on a child that's uh, two years of age or younger um, or someone who has trouble breathing or um or some kind of medical condition so that's another thing is that if people have the option to wear a mask or not we have to be careful to not make assumptions about people and in, in their situation and they may have a legitimate reason why they're not choosing to wear one if that is something that's expected to be done. Um, so just have grace and understanding, um, but do your best to maximize how much you're protecting everyone. So then we have these high touch surfaces, um, and I kind of touched on this um, before, but at minimum, I would daily wipe these high touch surfaces like the doorknobs. But say, for example, you have more than one service going on. Absolutely, I would wipe down these services in between services, you know, before the next group of congregants come in. And you can use also disinfectant sprays as well. So that's just, uh, just a great practice uh, to have. Um, I mentioned the, you know, doorknobs and handles for bathroom, but also don't forget light switches because uh, people touch those often. Um, and there's countertops and things that we already kind of, uh, think about. Um, now, if things, if there's areas that typically get high amount of traffic and, 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 and there's like, and it can get a lot of dirt on them, or like entranceways and mats, that's another thing you need to consider maybe having, you know, in a, a spray to kind of help kill germs off those uh, surfaces. Um, 
Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the social distancing and, and what do you do, you know, in a, in a, a facility um, where you have a lot of worshipers coming in. Um, you really need to think about how do you promote social distancing. And I've heard different ways of doing that. So, for example, if say you have a, a family and maybe they can sit in X number of chairs or pews, and then there could be a space, a gap between them and another group. I've heard of pews where every other pew is utilized. Those are different ways that people have thought about having social distancing as people are congregating. So I think all those are absolutely uh, reasonable. Um, if you can hold a service outdoors, if, you know, obviously if the weather's appropriate, that's better than being indoors. But if you're, it, you know, within a large, you know, indoor space, large is better than smaller. And then an area that gets a lot of ventilation is going to be helpful. So if you have the option to have windows down and have some air circulating, that's always a good thing. Of course, it all depends on the time of the year and, and the, the, the weather conditions. Um, when I talking about social distancing, even beyond the four walls of that church or synagogue or you know whatever um, you know where you're worshiping at, other thing I think you know I think people have to also think about is what about funerals, right? So don't forget to do these same practices of funerals and weddings, things that happen within many churches and, and places of worship, you know, around the country. Uh, but don't forget classes. So you, maybe you have a Bible study class, and, you know, on a, on a Wednesday night. Um, those are also times that you can't forget to also practice these same uh, measures. And having good signage is always good just to kind of remind people of different things. Now, one other thing that might not be something in the forefront of people's mind is what about these other things that people touch, like worship materials. So you can have a, you know, hymnals, um, prayer books, uh, bulletins, uh, fans, wiping those down as well is important because those tend to get passed from person to person. Um, so this is just, it's just additional measures. Um, thinking about when you pass around the, the offering or collection plate, is there another way that people could say pay their tithes and offerings as opposed to passing that plate around? And I think that um, there's other things where you may have a drop box where someone can put um, their tithes or offering in as opposed to having to pass a plate around. Um, or there could be ways that you can have people make um, their contributions, you know, virtually online and apps. There's a lot of different ways that I think we can go about doing this. Uh, another one is just what about as we interact with each other? So uh, I would consider not not doing as much shaking of hands and hugging and kissing if there's a high rate of COVID-19 in that in the community. Um, and I, that's difficult, particularly because, because that's what we do um, as we as we show express love and affection for our brothers and sisters. But in a pandemic, we have to use wisdom as well. So we have to guard ourselves, protect ourselves and protect others. Um, so, you know, you want to maintain that distance unless you have to um, just be careful. And another thing is what about just food? So we, 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 we may want to serve a group of people um, food. Well, what about those utensils that are being shared? So if you can have someone serving a group of people, maybe better than people self-serving and picking up a utensil, utensil and then someone else grabs that utensil. Um, nursing and child care facilities. And so a lot of you know religious institutions have nurseries and child care and that, and that can be challenging because germs pass and toys pass around but the more of wiping down surfaces than you normally would or in between use is always great um there's camps that happen during different times of the year so there's guidance about how to protect campers um and youth groups um obviously outdoors is better and then indoors similar things that we've already talked about i do think that it's be important for all clergy to make sure all staff is trained in all these things and, and vigilant and watching um, for this. And I think that's just how we all really just work together um, to make sure that things are safe. 
Now, so there's some additional considerations. Um, so one of the things is I would encourage if you're any of your staff or any of your congregants get sick, symptoms of whatever it is, it could be sneezing and coughing or um, fevers, tell them do not come into church. And if, if you're in close contact with someone who has COVID-19, stay at home. You don't want to run the chance of putting someone else at risk. And that's not only for like a you know a religious you know facility, but it's just, it was the same thing for the job. If you're sick, stay home. If your kids are sick, stay home. Um, now, if someone happens to get symptomatic or they're coughing or sneezing while they're you know in church, for example, um, and there's a concern. You may want to think about, well, is there a place where you can kind of get them away from others and isolate them as they're trying to gather their belongings and maybe leave and go out? So, you know, that may be something just to consider. And also for your staff, how, how can you quickly isolate um, and have a space for people to go? And then what if, what just God forbid, someone gets sick, really sick while they're, say, you know, at church, and they need to be rushed out somewhere. Well, what is your protocol? How are you going to the ambulance or you know transportation to a, a hospital or healthcare facility? So you know, think through those things. This is kind of like contingency planning. Um, and so these are all things that we all just have to kind of be aware of. And I think all of you have been doing that, but just there may be a few subtle things that you may not be thinking through. Now, for church staff, some churches have employed staff. And so you got to think about, well, some people may be out sick or they may be exposed to COVID-19. So how do you make their schedules flexible? How, you know, can they do some tasks remotely at home versus having to come in? All important things to, to have to think through um, because we may be going backwards where things can escalate. And that then means that more people could be calling out sick at, at times, and but how do you maintain operations and get things to st still get done? Um, so make sure that people know if they're sick around you, who do they call to notify? You know, do you have volunteers? And if you're depending on volunteers to perform some function, well, what's the, what's the pr procedures that they need to take as well? And make sure there's a lot of signage for people just to know what to do if they you know and make sure you have personal protective equipment around we're talking about gloves and and things if someone you know if, if people need those things uh, and then always check check with your local health authorities the health department's a great resource there's sometimes there's big hospital systems that may be close to where some people live and ask them for any guidance or recommendations. And then certainly I think the health department will always be willing to give suggestions and, and, and advice. Um, and then the other thing I just wanna say is closing the facilities. And this is uh, touchy, but we, we've seen this where sometimes there may be an exposure that happens, say, at, you know, or somebody at church identify they got exposed potentially at the church and now there may be multiple people that have to get contact tracing from the health department and they identify oh maybe there's three or four congregants and this is all common link they were in the, the facility church facility at the same time okay well what do you do at that point well immediately when you find that out i would suggest doing a deep cleaning of the facility and take the time to close it down do the cleaning at the direction and guidance of the health department, and then you'll be able to open it back up. Um, and then obviously coordinate with any of the health department officials that may give you suggestions or they may need cooperation to help identify spread of illness and disease. Um, you just provide them with the information that they need to know and uh, they know um, how to make sure things are all done confidential and, and in order. And so that's uh, really, uh, uh, really what I wanted to make sure that you know specifically about what we need to do um, to 
make sure that we're aware of what's happening as we're, you know, trying to go back to a new sense of normal, whatever that is, but do everything in a safe manner. And this keeps on evolving and changing. And so we have to stay abreast of all this information. So this form right here is a way to give you the most up-to-date, latest information. It's the last thing I'll just um, comment on um, is this the variant strains that we're, we're hearing about. I wanna just talk a little bit deeper and then I'll just end my remarks is every virus mutates, it shifts and changes. Sometimes the mutations are benign. That means they don't cause any trouble in humans. And then sometimes they mutate and they cause trouble. And what's happening is the original version of coronavirus has mutated and changed. So we have an alpha strain and a beta strain and delta strain. There's even a gamma strain. And we're getting a lot of attention right now with this Delta strain because it is more contagious than the regular version, the original version of coronavirus. And when you have that, what happens is with this virus, particularly this variant strain, it can attach and attack the body and the lungs more easily than the original version of coronavirus. So it not only can transmit easier, but then it can potentially cause more severe illness. So people will, will be sicker. So that, this is why we're at a race against time to get more people vaccinated. And the thing that I'm really worried about, and I hope this doesn't happen, is there could be a variant strain that emerges that the vaccines are completely ineffective against. Right now, the vaccines seem to work fairly decent with the Delta variant, but you have to get vaccinated. And if not enough people get vaccinated, we are going to see more and more cases, particularly in Alabama, where we're flaring up more than other parts of the country. It's disrupting our lives more putting vulnerable citizens at risk. And all this is preventable. It's preventable because you can get vaccinated. And if you are not sure if you wanna get vaccinated or not personally, or you have friends and family, I would encourage you have a conversation with a healthcare provider that knows your medical history, your risk. If say you don't have a medical provider, well, go to your local pharmacy and just have a conversation. So someone who's has a additional level of expertise and training and knowledge about this, have that conversation. And then also within families, have a sit down and just have it and see what any outstanding questions are, reservations. And if there are concerns, then, then the question is, let's go get the facts. Let's get the information to then settle that question or that concern. And then we have to make a decision. The decision is, are we choosing life over death? Are we going to defeat this pandemic or not? Are we going to make a sacrifice not only for ourselves and how do we protect ourselves, but what about for our family and our community? And I think that's the mindset that we all should be under, that we need to be unified in our approach to handle this. And there are hardworking scientists and medical professionals and public health professionals that are look, analyzing this information, is evolving and changing as we speak, having to re-educate, have to oftentimes change some of the things we may have said in the past. And we understand that at times that may limit people's confidence in what they're being told because it's a lot of confusion, a lot of noise, but there's also a lot of disinformation. There's a lot of people that are purposely putting out hurtful information to confuse people. So still, the trusted resources in my mind is the CDC, the health department, major academic medical centers, like these big hospital systems. And I would use those sources as primary sources more than anything else. Um, and if you hear anything that seems of concern or odd or interesting, 
get to the source of it. So someone says, I heard that the vaccine does such and such. Give me the, where'd you get that from? Is it a reputable source? What are the facts about it? And if, and if they can't answer that, then you go to someone who has that information and then you then can make an informed choice. You're, because knowledge is power and you need the knowledge and we all need to work together. So I appreciate your time listening to what I have to say in my comments. Um, I pray that everyone stays safe um, and that we return to a new normal. Good evening. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Those that love the Lord, give God a hand of praise. Oh yes, he's worthy to be praised. Our God is great and he is greatly to be praised. Welcome this afternoon. This is the Dean's Hour. We give all praises to God, honor to our esteemed president and his most efficient staff to the honored and esteemed pastor of this, the Elizabeth Missionary Baptist Church, to all members of the clergy, ladies and gentlemen, we greet you in Jesus. We say this afternoon, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Dean's Hour. We thank God for the voice and the vision of our Dean. We shall proceed with our order of service as this. Next, we will have a scripture, prayer, and a song by Deacon James Davis. After that, we will have a memorial period by the Reverend Lester Walker, Assistant Dean in the Alabama State Congress, Baptist Congress of Christian Education. And then we will have our love offering for the Dean by Dr. Edward E. Rogers. And after the offering, I will return. God bless you, God keep you is our prayer. Psalm 100, Psalm of David, tells us how to act and react when we come into the house of worship and the house of prayer. It reads, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All ye lands, serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pastor. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his holy name. And number five, it's the one that I love, verse five. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. I read to you the hundred number of songs. Man should always pray. We are living in some evil and perilous times. In times like these, we need a savior. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In times like these, we need an anchor. A songwriter said, make sure your anchor holds and grip the solid rock. And somebody said, well, who is that rock? A songwriter and my grandmother answered that question a long, long time ago. This rock is Jesus. He is the one. Yes, sir. Yes, 
He is the only one. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come thanking you. For this is the day that you have made. And Lord, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Knowing, Lord, that you are God. And besides thee, there is no other. Yes. Lord, in you we live, we move, and we, we have our being. Lord, you are the maker and creator of every good and perfect gift. Lord, we just assemble together in this state congress, Lord, just to say thank you. Thank you for being who you are. You are the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and is to come. Lord, you woke us up this morning, clothed in our right minds, and giving us a use and activities of our limbs. The blood was running warm through our veins. And Lord, we just want to say thank you. Lord, so many, we call their names, they couldn't answer. Because you called them, Heavenly Father, from labor to reward. Lord, you are God. Yes, sir. You are the true and living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sits high and looks low. You're omnipresent. You're omniscient, your heavenly Father. Lord God, you are our all in all. Lord, we just thank you for food. We thank you for shelter. Lord, during this pandemic, you've been food for us. Lord, you've been shelter for us. Lord, you supplied all of our needs according to your riches and glory. And Lord, we just want to say thank you. Lord, you've been good to us. Lord, you've been good to us. Lord, you brought us a mighty long way, but I want to go one step further. Lord, you brought us all the way. Lord, from the rocking of our cradles to this very moment, through many dangers, toils, seen and unseen, Heavenly Father, you've been with us. Lord, you brought us through this pandemic. But not only this pandemic, Father, you brought us through our ups and downs, through our sicknesses, Heavenly Father. Lord, you've been right there. But Lord, you told us over 2,000 years ago to cast all our cares upon you. Lord, you said that your yoke is easy and your burdens are light. Yes, sir. And Lord, we know that to be a fact. And Lord, you promised us you'll never leave us. And Lord, you said you'll never forsake us. And Lord, we're standing on your word. Lord, be with this great nation. These we call the United States of America. Oh Lord, be with the leaders of this nation on the local, state, national, international, and world levels. Lord, let them lean not to their own understanding. But in all their ways, acknowledge you that you may direct their path. Lord, this world is in trouble. But Lord, you told us that these things would be. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you now that we already have the victory in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for this Alabama State Congress of Christian Education and all its leaders. Those who make up this great Congress, Heavenly Father, they have a powerful work to do. But Lord, you said you are with us always. Lord, we pray for the sick. Pray, Heavenly Father, for the shedding, the bereaved, the prison bound, those in war torn countries. Lord, we lift them up to you right now. In the mighty name of thy Son Jesus, we pray. Amen down through the years the Lord has been good to us I don't know about you but the Lord has been he's been good to me yes sir yes sir over a million people have died worldwide over 8,000 9,000 in this state of Alabama but Lord you allowed me on last Friday to see another birthday and Lord, I just want to say thank you. 
During this year, President Washington, I had a lot of friends that have passed. I had one of my best friends that I grew up with in Edgewater passed on Sunday. But we're still here. And we give God the honor, the glory, and praise. And I love them old Dr. Watts. Down through the years, the Lord been good to me. Oh, down through the years, you know the Lord been good to me. Oh, down through the years, yeah, the Lord been good to me. He's been good, really been good to me. Oh, Satan had me bound. The Lord been good to me. Oh, Satan had me bound. You know the Lord been good to me. Oh, Satan had me bound. The Lord been good to me. He's been good, really been good to me. Fix me, Lord Jesus. Come on and fix me if you please. Yes, sir. But if you don't fix me while I'm standing up, then I'll bow down on my knee. I come to tell you that down through the years, you know the Lord been good to me. Oh, down through the years, you know the Lord been good to me. Oh, To me, he's been good, really been good to me. I know I got good religion, I didn't get it from no dream. You can wake me, shake me in the midnight hour, and I'll tell you everything I've seen. I come to tell you that down through the years, John the Revelator writes and he says in the book of Revelations chapter 14 verse 13 he says I heard a voice from heaven saying write then he says blessed are they that die in the Lord from henceforth yea saith the spirit for they rest from their labor and their Works do follow them. We rise at this time to give memorial to those Christian education laborers who have given themselves in the vineyard of Christian education. Many of our brothers and sisters over this last year have moved on, they have transitioned from labor to reward. And we recognize those individuals who have shared, who have worked diligently in the Alabama Missionary Baptist State Congress of Christian Education. Many great educators and many great leaders across the state of Alabama have lost their lives over this last year. 
great contributors to this work of this state convention, great contributors to the work of our Congress of Christian Education, and we'll be remiss to end this session without making mention of those who have labored and have gone from labor to reward. We will remember them, we will constantly think of them, but we do have hope because though we miss them, we sorrow not as others which have no hope. So we say to those of us who will remember them, their labor, their contributions to Christian education in the state of Alabama, yes, we, we remember you. We remember your labor, but we sorrow from a proper perspective. For we sorrow not as others which have no hope. For our hope is based upon a premise and predicated upon a promise. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Yes, sir. And those who sleep in Jesus Christ will rise again. And John says in the book of John chapter 5, He that hath the Son hath life. And our life is based upon our faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. So the revelator says correctly when he says, blessed are those who die in the Lord. For precious are the saints who have given their lives to our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. And we say again, thank you for your contributions. Thank you for your labor. Thank you for all that you have done for the work of Christian education in this Alabama Baptist State Missionary Baptist Convention and in our Congress of Christian Education. Let us pray. God of heaven, our Father, we thank you for the joy of knowing that life is in Jesus the Christ. And though we transition from labor to reward, we find confidence in knowing that if this earth and house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have a house of God that not made but hands that's eternal in the heavens. Many of our brothers and sisters have transitioned, have gone on to that city where no traveler even desires to return. So we say that though death has invaded our mortal ranks and have claimed the body of our brothers and sisters in Christ, we now submit to the will of our Heavenly Father who have taken the souls of our deceased sisters and brothers to live eternally with Him in heaven. So we thank you for their contributions. We thank you for their labor of love. We thank you for their patient hope. And we also thank you, Lord, for the gift of eternal life that is in Jesus the Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is time to give. We have a dean that has served and he has worked all through the year. And we are to show our love and our, by honoring him with our gifts. The Bible says better to give than to receive. We can give our way through this pandemic by loving one another. Giving in this love offering is charity, is good ground. And so we ask that you will prepare for your giving. As we prepare now, we're going to ask that you give. We're going to start it off with a hundred dollars. And we ask that you join us by way of, they should have it on the screen. Those ways, those of us who are here, we're going to come and we're going to give at this time. Let's show some love. As you come, I believe it's a basket on that side and a basket on this side. Dr. Vernon Swift, the pastor of this great Elizabeth Baptist Church, $100. Dr. C. Michael Washington and family, $200. To Dr. McPherson from Reverend Dr. Walker, Lester Walker, $100.
Reverend Dr. Turner, $100. All the way from Huntsville, Alabama. Dr. Cunningham, $100. As we give, and those who are by way of uh, Facebook, YouTube, we want you to give. We want Dr. Matt Filson to see your love and to show appreciation to his labor. The address is on the screen. You can mail it to him. Uh, 306 Marsha Avenue, Hueytown, Alabama, 35023. You can do that. It's on the screen and you can mail it to him. That'll be a wonderful day when the mailman run and your name is on a letter. Everyone has given, bow your head just a moment. Our Father, thank you for the love that has been shown to our Dean. We ask God that you will take that which is given and multiply it and encourage your worker. Let him know that you're with him through the people who share their love and charity with him. And we give you honor, glory, and praise in the name of Jesus the Christ, amen. Let us all say amen. Shall we say amen again? Amen. Thank God for this offering. Thank God. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. One thing I can say about him, he leads by example. And I love that and respect that about him. Every man has a purpose in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly, nor of necessity. For the Lord loveth a cheerful giver. Amen, amen and amen. God bless your hearts. At this time, I'm going to ask the Reverend Jeffrey Bennett if he would come and present our Dean for this evening. Let us receive him as he comes. Let the church say amen. amen. Let us say amen again. Amen. The word tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. My Christian brothers and sisters, I stand to introduce the speaker of the hour. He is no stranger to the preaching of the gospel. He is a fellow servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is one of the 50 year Continuous Pastoral Minister, Minister Honorees for the year of 2021. He is the pastor of the St. John Baptist Church in Edgewater for more than 50 plus years. He's an author of the book, A Drum Major for God, and A Perfume Springer to Man. He's a civil rights icon. He's the first black in Birmingham to pass the Birmingham test for the police officer, the fireman, in the civil service exam. He was a professor at Mars College. He has a PhD in chemistry from Howard University. He has a law degree from Mars College. He organized the 1962 Mars College student bar cart on the segregated Birmingham business. He served as the dean of the Mount Peregrine District Association for many years. Now he serves as the dean of the greatest Congress on this side of the United States of America, the Alabama State of Christian Education. 
He is the husband of one wife, Sister Agnes McPherson. There's two children, Pastor Jonathan McPherson Jr., the pastor of World Overcomers in Bessemer, Alabama. His daughter, Sister Carla Calvert Esquire. He is a man of integrity. My brothers and sisters, without further instruction, I'd like to welcome you, the Speaker of the Hour, the Honorable Reverend Dr. Jonathan McPherson, Sr., the Dean of the Alabama State of Christian Education. Let's show him some love as we will come now. Amen. Dr. McPherson. First of all, to Reverend Bennett for his very kind introduction. I want to say to all of us, as we come for this occasion, which has brought us to the historic city, Tuscaloosa, city where champions are made. And to be at this distinguished and historic church, Elizabeth Baptist Church, where our president, former president, Dr. Swift, served. Now to our cousin president, Dr. Owens, and our Congress president, Dr. C. Michael Washington and his very fine family Amen. here. Did you see that son of his Amen. who was on national television Amen. about two weeks ago? <laughs> We're so glad to have each one of you national officers we have here Dr. Cunningham, we are thankful for your presence. We are thankful for our assistant dean, Dr. Lester O. Walker. Amen. Amen. All of the members of the dean's staff. And I especially thank my Chief Administrative Assistant, Sister Dorothy McAdory, and for all that she does to make this Congress work what it is. And it's notable for Sister McAdory, she has served under three deans. That was Dean Smith, Dean Carvin, and now Dean McPherson, and I'm thankful for the presence of my help meet. I'm thankful for the presence of this great lady. Every time I say my prayers, I thank God, number one. I thank him for the great assistance and service that she renders to your servant. And then I thank God for the very anointed, beautiful job she does every Wednesday in Bible study of teaching us God's holy and unadulterated word. I think I may have told you once before, we have been happily married 58 years. And I want you to know that when I started 58 years ago, 
I started calling her sweet meat. And you know what? After 58 years, the meat is still sweet. And I thank God for that. And now I have the privilege of preaching the truth that opened man's eyes. And I want to say a word about the way that God men's feet and preach only the life that gives men hope. I'm going to first of all look at book of Hebrews. I want us to look at chapter 12, verse 1, where the great apostle Paul, wherefore sin, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And then I want to look at Paul, this letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6 there, verse 11, where Paul tells us to put on the whole armor of God that we might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And I want to lay on the hearts of God's people this subject, get rid of your baggage, put on your equipment, and go to the battlefield. And I want to begin by informing each one of us about a matter that I'm sure you are already aware of. And that matter is this. There is an ongoing conflict between the forces of good and the forces of evil. And those of us who have committed ourselves to Jesus Christ, those of us who refer to ourselves as Christians, we are involved in it. Yes, we are at war. A struggle is going on. A battle is raging between God's army and Satan's army. And since we have chosen sides, we find ourselves actively involved in this conflict. Now the writer of Hebrews, he refers to this ongoing conflict. He says it's a race which all Christians must run. It's a marathon because it extends from the moment that we accept Jesus Christ as our personal savior to the moment when our earthly lives will come to a close. Now this race, which the writer to the Hebrews speaks about, I want you to know it's longer than the 100 yard dash. I want you to know it's more demanding than the 400 meter relay. In this race, you can run for a short while and then hand the baton to another runner. This is an individual race which begins when we sign up to live for Christ. And this race does not end until we sign off and go get our reward. In a sense, this race begins when we check in 
and it goes on until we check out. Now Paul was a sports fan and on one occasion Paul had the opportunity to watch the Olympic Games which were being held in Greece. Paul sat there in the grandstand. He watched the runners come up to the starting line and they would discard all of their excess baggage. And it gave Paul a bright idea about the life of a Christian. And Paul compared the life of a Christian to an extended race in which all of us must participate. And I think that's a good comparison because this Christian life is a race from the very moment that we get on the track, we are trying to outrun temptation. And in too many instances, we allow temptation to overtake us and we become the victim rather than the victor. So life, if you didn't know it, is a race against trouble. Now we take all sorts of precautions and we run like the devil trying to stay ahead of trouble. But I want you to know that despite our best efforts, trouble seems to catch up with us sooner or later. And if trouble hasn't caught up with you yet, just keep on living and you'll see old man trouble creeping up beside you. You can't make it to the finish line without being overtaken by trouble. Also, we try to outrun heartaches. We try to outrun disappointments. We try to outrun sickness. And we try to outrun pain. But despite our best efforts, these opponents, at some period during the race, they will overtake us and hinder our forward progress. So human life, and especially this Christian life, is a long extended race. So here's Paul now, got his seat in the grandstand, and his seat was near the starting line of the racetrack. And Paul could see clearly what these participants would do before they started to run. He noticed that they would come to the head of the racetrack they were wearing a well warm up suit that consisted of some sweat pants and a jacket. They wore some metal weights around their ankles that strengthened the muscles in their legs. Now all of those items were considered to be excess baggage and no runner in his right mind would begin the race with those cumbersome materials attached to his body. The other runners, as well as the spectators, they would look upon that person as an oddball if he tried to run the race wearing a warm-up jacket and mill weights around his ankles. So just before the signal was given for the race to begin. All of the runners would take off their warm-up suits as well as their ankle weights, and they'll lay them aside. 
And you might say they did what you might call an athletic strip tease. They removed everything but their shorts and their shirts. They wore just enough to be decent. And anything more than the bare minimum would be considered as excess baggage and would hinder them from running a successful race. So when Paul looked around that grandstand, he noticed a whole lot of retired champions who had come to lend their moral support and to cheer the present runner. And he noticed a contestant stripping down, getting ready to run. Paul took out his pen and he started scribbling some words on the back of his program. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. In other words, Paul was saying, this movement that we call Christianity it's a race against sin and Satan. And if we have any hope of being successful, we got to start by getting rid of excess baggage. It's extremely difficult to run a successful race against Satan and the forces of evil even when you have stripped down to the bare minimum. Well, it's extremely difficult when you have become slim and trim. You can just imagine how difficult it is if you're carrying some excess baggage. So before you attempt to run, strip down, take it off, Lay it aside, cast it away, get rid of your baggage. Now, I want to leave the grandstand. I want to leave that racetrack in Dries. I want to take our eyes off of those Olympic runners. They participated in the game 2,000 years ago but I want us to focus upon July the 15th, 2021, upon those who call ourselves Christians, who are called upon to run a race. And the reason far too many of us fail in this contest is because we are weighted down with too much baggage. How would you feel now about a contestant in a foot race? And here he is attempting to run while he's got a big overcoat on. He's got a steel helmet. He got a three-piece suit on and then got some heavy cowboy boots on. If you saw him, you would quickly conclude that his bread was not done and that his elevator was not going to the top floor. Well, I want you to know that that's the impression that many of us give when we attempt to run the Christian race and we refuse to take off our earthly baggage. I want to make it plain now what's some of the baggage that we refuse to take off and lay aside that hinders us from running a successful race. Well, one of the most common weights 
among so many Christians is loose living. Loose living. By that I mean violating the rules of what this Bible calls moral and ethical conduct. In order to run successfully in this Christian race, you got to hold up some high standards and you got to obey some rules. A lifestyle that's characterized by blatant disrespect for morality and decency, that's excess baggage. And if you're carrying it, you need to put it down. Get rid of your baggage. Now here's another way that will hinder you from running a successful race, and that is carrying a grudge and refusing to forgive. Carrying a grudge and refusing to forgive. You got to realize that when you carry a grudge and spend your time planning to get revenge for some wrong that was done against you years ago. I had a lady come to our church at a film, two of them. One, the other one, still had a grudge 20 years ago. And when I inquired what it was about, it was about when they were little girls. One took a doll from the other one. And 20 years later, still got that drug. You got to realize that when you do that, you're using your precious time that could be used in trying to improve your own situation. Because that grudge that you are holding will do more damage than you to you than it will to the person with whom you're angry. That person for whom you're carrying a grudge will be somewhere having a good time. And you will be sitting at home with your mouth poked out, got a headache, got a ulcer, and a high blood pressure. And if you carry a grudge and hold resentment, you're loading yourself down with unnecessary weights and burdens that will hinder you from running a successful race. Now, if that's your problem, get rid of your baggage. Now, here's another kind of baggage that will hinder your progress as you try to run the Christian race. And this one is human, human baggage. If you are in a relationship which is illegal, a relationship that's immoral, a relationship that's unlawful, you need to get rid of your baggage. Young people, if you got some so-called friends and you got some running buddies and they are traveling down a dead end street and they are carrying you down that same street with them, you need to get rid of your baggage. And let me tell you something, when you start feeling, fooling with these drugs and stuff, you got friends fooling with it, you got to realize that you are heading down a dead end street. A street that will end at the cemetery or a street that will end at the penitentiary. Sometimes our friends, our associates, have more influence over us than we have over them. And if we allow ourselves to be controlled by them, you'll find yourself digging a hole for yourself. And before you know it, you're going to be in deep trouble. Get rid of that human baggage. 
This Christian race is a marathon. It calls for character. It calls for patience. It calls for endurance. And if anybody think that he or she can run a successful race while weighted down with a whole lot of worldly baggage, then you have another thought coming. I want to say it again, get rid of your baggage. Now, let us say that we have gotten rid of all of our baggage. That's good. It's good to be relieved of those worldly hindrances. But I want you to know that after we get rid of our baggage, there's something else that Paul tells us that we must do. When Paul wrote that letter to the church at Ephesus, he said that if you're going to, if we are going to move from promise to possession, we got to remember Paul said to the Ephesians, he compared this Christian life to a war. And Paul said that if we want to achieve any measure of victory, we got to be properly equipped. Properly equipped. Short, not enough to get rid of our excess baggage. After you do that, you got to put on your fighting equipment. Now listen at Paul now. He gives a list of the items that make up our fighting equipment. He gives us some frightening information about the strength and the skill of our opponent. And you know how it is. If you're going to fight against some little weak, measly run, he ain't got no training, ain't got no skills, you don't have to bother and worry about putting on special fighting equipment. When you know that your opponent is a pushover, you don't waste any time preparing for the fight. You just step in the ring, you hit him with a left jab, then you give him a uppercut, and then the fight is going to be over. But on the other hand, if you know that your opponent is a big, strong, muscular, well-trained, highly skilled professional, you got to take every possible step you can to prepare for the fight. Now in this same line of thought, Paul said to the Ephesians, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And now, my friends, there's no way you can listen to that strong language and then refuse to get yourself properly equipped. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying our fight is not just against human beings as we are. If we were fighting against men and women on our own level, we can just give them a few uppercuts, a couple of turnaround boot kicks like Walker and Texas Ranger, and then the battle would be over. But that's not the case. Our fight is against well-trained, well-organized forces of the devil. Our fight is against demons, evil spirits of every description. Our fight is against the devil himself. And I want you to know that he's a professional warrior. He has conquered some of God's 
most prominent soldiers. So with that thought in mind, Paul tells them, put on the whole armor of God. Now Paul started down at the bottom and he comes all the way up to the top because knowing the importance of a good and solid foundation, Paul says, be sure that your feet, your feet are shod with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And make sure that your loins are good about with truth. Take unto yourself the breastplate of righteousness. Put on the helmet of salvation. And be sure that you are equipped with the shield of faith. And then don't forget to pick up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Think about that equipment. Your feet are protected by the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? It is the good news that Jesus Christ arose from the dead and that he is alive forever more. That's full and complete. That's a good foundation to be standing on. Your loins are good about with truth. You are saturated with the undeniable truth that we all are sinners in need of a savior. And that saving grace is available to all those who accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior. Now, next, you have on the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness, your life is characterized by goodness. Your life is characterized by cleanliness. Your life is characterized by holiness. And then your head, your head is covered with the helmet of salvation. And then you know that you have been washed in the blood of Jesus and that you have been brought from death unto life. Now to add to all of that, you got the shield of faith. Faith to protect you from the threats of Satan. Faith to hold you when the world is crumbling all around you. Faith to keep you when all the odds are against you. And finally, you got the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What a weapon! What a weapon! There's nothing like the Word of God to put Satan in his place. When, when you can say it is written, when you can say thus saith the Lord, you can put Satan on the run. So you need to put on your equipment. You need to be dressed from head to toe. You need to be covered from top to bottom. You need to put on the whole armor of God. Here's your order of preparation now. First, get rid of your baggage. Then you must put on your equipment. And after you put on your equipment, you got to get out on the battlefield. There's no use of making all that preparation if you're not going to fight. And you don't have to worry about starting the fight, the war, is already in progress. It started way back in the Garden of Eden when Satan came on the scene. 
and persuaded Adam and Eve to disobey God. So that war is going on. That war is in full swing. And I want to tell you, it's not a cold war. This is a hot war. It's a war against sin. It's a war against Satan. It's a war against racism. It's a war against corruption. It's a war against hypocrisy. It's a war against apathy. It's a war against complacency. It's a war against pornography. It's a war against child abuse. It's a war against narcotics. It's a war against babies having babies. It's a war against crime. It's a war against drive-by shootings. It's a war against deadbeat daddies. It's a war against wayward mothers. It's a war against crooked politicians. A war is going on. And if you want to achieve any level of victory, you got to get out on the battlefield right now. Once again, here's how you do it. First, get rid of your baggage. Next, put on your equipment, and then you go to the battlefield. Let me put it like this. First, you got to get rid of gossip. Then you must put on gospel. You must get rid of lying. Then you must put on truth. You must get rid of wrongdoing. Then you must put on righteousness. You must get rid of damnation. And then you must put on salvation. You must get rid of doubt. Then you must put on faith. You must get rid of the weapons of the world. And you must put on the sword of the spirit. And I'll guarantee you, as I come to a close, that if you follow that plan, you'll give the devil a run for his money. I want to know now, are you ready for battle? I don't know about you, but I'm ready for anything that the devil wants to start because I'm on the battlefield. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. The lady used to say it and she would say, and I promise that I will serve him till I die. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. And I want to add one other verse. I'm going to, I'm going to add one other verse to that now. My verse, I'll tell him that I may be hopping, but I say to old Satan, I'm not stopping because I'm out on the battlefield for my Lord. Amen again. Let us say it one more time. That's a word from the Lord. Thank you, Dean McPherson. Thank God for his word. You know, after hearing a word like that, I know and I feel like everybody here is saved and we know the Lord, but we still need to extend an invitation for discipleship and offer Christ and at this time, I'm just going to ask if we could just do one verse. When Dean was mentioning that song, I'm on the battlefield, I'm going to ask if we would all just join in just a little bit on that verse, and we're going to open the doors of the church and extend an, a, an invitation for discipleship. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. Oh, and I promise.
promise him that I would serve him till I die. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. Oh, and I promise him that I would serve him till I die. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. Oh, and I was alone and idle, and I was a sinner too, and I heard a voice from heaven saying there is work to do and I heard the master's hand and I joined the Christian band I am on the battlefield for my Lord will you help me today oh I am on the battlefield for my Lord. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. And I promise him that I would serve him till I I am on the battlefield for my praise God. Praise God. Give God a hand of praise this afternoon. We have heard from heaven. We've got to let some of this baggage go if we want to stay on the battlefield. God bless you. Thank you, Dean McPherson. This time we're going to have closing comments. And I want you to just hold this sign up. This sign says, want the killings to stop, bring your family to church. Now I thank God for this beautiful family. That's the Washington, this husband, this wife, and the beautiful children they have. Now I've already, we're going to announce what I call, it's going to be a family life education project. We're going to kick off and it's going to be held at the historic 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. Now what it is designed to do, there was a lady at our convention Dr. Ethel T. Fallon. Any of y'all remember her? She was the third vice president of the National Women's, president of our women's auxiliary. I heard her make this statement at Selma University when she gave her last presidential address. She said, the White House will not get better. The State House will not get better. Church house will not get better. Our individual lives will not get better apart from the word of Almighty God. Thank you, Brother President, for reinforcing that to us. Now what we are planning to have, and here's what I'm going to ask. Dr. Vernon Swift is still here. I'm going to ask when we have put this together now read this one. Now these are magnetic signs. I have made up a hundred of these that we give freely to people if you could put on your car. It says put down these guns 
pick up a Bible and take a shot at the devil and not at each other. Somewhere we got to address, as the president said, so much killings and crime, especially among our people. We got to address the fact that you got more black men in the penitentiaries of Alabama than we have in our churches. Now what I'm putting together, this is a family life education project that we got to get our people where they can be taught. Now they're not being taught the word of God. We know what the pandemic has done and before that. But we're going to ask the every, all of our churches throughout Alabama, because we're going to speak to Governor Ivey about this. And then from that, we're going to Jerry Young. So we want every Baptist church in the country. There are just some things that we got to teach our young people, our people. And I start with things like God's prohibition against the taking of a human life. I got somebody who gonna teach that to our people. We got to teach our people God's prohibition against stealing, the unlawful taking of another person's possession. I already have our president down for what I want him to teach. And one part of that, that we're going to, we're going to promote an outstanding family. And I've already put, that's going to be the Washington family. Because there's a proverb in Ghana which says, the ruin of a nation begins with the breakdown in the family. And this is what we have in the African-American family, breakdown. Most of this violence occurs domestic within the family. So what I am putting together, as God has been moving on my heart, is going to address. And we have other topics that our people need to be taught. For instance, Reverend Bennett here, he's already making the right choices in life. Young people, coming up need to be taught how to make the right choice. It's going to be subjects that our people vitally need. And we're going to take this program that I'm putting together is designed to be last for 14 weeks and go meet twice a week, starting at the 16th Baptist Church, Tuesdays and Thursdays from six o'clock uh, to eight. And when we get everything together, I'll be calling all of the pastors together. You will be, some of you will be teaching because we want you to teach this in our churches, in our Congress. Because as Dr. Fallon said, White House won't get better, State House won't get better, Church house won't get better. Your individual lives will not get better apart from the word of Almighty God. So what this is going to be about these 14 weeks, just teaching our people the word of Almighty God. Because the president said in this message, that's what's going to bring them through the storm. God didn't promise to save us from the storm. But he said, my son, I'll save you in the storm. If anyone would like to have one of these, I have two or three in my car and I got some more. I had a hundred of them made up, they're absolutely free. Those people who would be teaching, you're not going to come and teach those courses for nothing. When you finish, we're going to give you something, a stipend for everything that you do. If you'd like to have one of these, you just leave word. We'll send you one free, no charge whatsoever. Amen, amen. Praise God. Thank God for each of you. Thank you, Dean McPherson, for 
preaching out of the depths of your heart. God bless each of you. Thank you for coming, sharing this afternoon, and if all hearts and minds are satisfied, shall we stand? Let us pray. Dear God, our Father, thank you for this worship experience. Thank you for our Dean, Dr. Jonathan McPherson. Thank you for his family. Thank you for the anointing that is over his life. Continue to strengthen him. Bless him. Bless his family. Bless his church family. Continue to be with the ministry and the works that he's doing for the Alabama State Baptist Congress of Christian Education. We bless your name. All glory and praises belong to you. For your glory and the good of your children, we pray. For we ask it now in Jesus' name. The grace of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with your hearts now and forevermore. All of God's people say, Amen.